The subcommittee will come to order. <clears throat> the chair will recognize himself for an opening statement. Today, the subcommittee will consider some unfinished business from the last Congress in the form of six bills. The Veteran Emergency Medical Technician Support Act, sponsored by Representative Adam <coughs> Kinzinger, would assist states in streamlining their certification requirements for those veterans with emergency medical technician training who want to work in the civilian workforce. The National All Scheduled Prescription Electronic Reporting Reauthorization Act, or NASPR, sponsored by Representative Ed Whitfield, would reauthorize the NASPR program to support state prescription drug monitoring programs. The Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act, sponsored by Representative Burgess, Ranking Member Green, would um, reauthorize certain trauma care programs through FY 2019. The Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care for All Americans Act, to be sponsored by Representative Burgess, Ranking Member Green, would reauthorize trauma care center care grants. H.R. 471, introduced by Representative Marino, Blackburn, Welch, and Chu, the Ensuring Patients Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2015 would improve law enforcement efforts regarding prescription drug di diversion and abuse, and the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act, which I introduced along with Ranking Member Pallone last Congress and will be reintroducing shortly, seeks to improve the transparency and consistency of the Drug Enforcement Agency's scheduling of new FDA-approved drugs under the Controlled Substances Act. Look forward to hearing the testimony of all of our witnesses today. Yield the remainder of my time to Representative Whitfield. Well, Chairman Pitts, thank you very much for having this hearing today on the important topic of public health and for including NASPR reauthorization draft as part of that uh, discussion. I'm delighted that Mr. John uh, Eady is with us today, and we look forward to his testimony. He has a 35 years or so experience with the drug monitoring issues, and look forward to your testimony. I might add that uh, we've reached a point, unfortunately, in America today where more people are dying from drug overdoses than they are from prescription drug overdose than they are from automobile accidents. And I would just say that back in 2001, the Appropriations Committee, uh, without any authorization from the authorizing committee, started a drug monitoring program, which turned out to be a very good program. In 2005, this committee came back through uh, Congressman Colon and Mr. Pitts and myself and others, and we authorized uh, NASPR, a national all-prescription drug monitoring program for the entire country. We had great difficulty obtaining um, uh, funding for it because the appropriators always funneled the money through the drug monitoring program at the Department of Justice. NASPR was at HHS. And so ever since uh, 2005, we've had sort of two different programs. Unfortunately, the one at HHS was not getting any funding, uh, basically. Uh, today, most states do have drug monitoring programs, but uh, we still have these s separate programs, one at DOJ and one at HHS, and so hopefully we tried to explore about a year ago a way to sort of combine these programs to just make it more efficient and more uh, helpful to the American people, and I don't think we've totally resolved that yet, but uh, I do think it's important we reauthorize this program, and I look forward to maybe having some discussions with you, Mr. Eady, and others that have an interest in is there a way that we can still try to get these programs together. <laughs> and with that, I yield back balance my time. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Green, five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to our witnesses for y'all being here today. This hearing was called to examine six proposals which will strengthen public health, each which is a product of bipartisan efforts. I thank the chairman for having this hearing. It's not only an opportunity to further these important pieces of legislation, but it also serves as a reminder of the great work this committee can accomplish when we work together to advance our health care system. The Veteran Emergency Medical Technician Support Act is led by Representatives Katzler, 
uh, Kinzinger and Caps, the legislation will stabilize, will help states utilize the skills of our nation's veterans and address emergency medical technician shortages by streamlining the certification and licensure requirements of returning veterans who have completed military EMT training. The Improving Regulatory Trans uh, Transparencies for New Medical Therapies Act, that's the last time I'll say that, um, provides a solution to current delays and experiences by patients in need. The, in the amount of time the DA has asked before uh, acting on FDA rec recommendations has lengthened in recent years, delaying the availability of new therapies. Led by Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone, this legislation will improve patient access by bringing clarity and transparency to the process of scheduling new FDA-approved therapy. Representative Marino, Welch, Blackburn, and Chu introduced the Ensuring Patient Access Effective Drug Enforcement Act. This legislation would promote patient access to medically necessary controlled substances and that with the DA's authority to suspend uh, a DEA registrant acting in a manner that puts public health and safety at risk. The National Associ uh, All Schedules Prescription Electronic Reporting, or NASPER Reauthorization Act by our Ranking Member Pallone and Representative Whitfield will reauthorize the improved prescription drug monitoring programs are essential to part of our nation's effort to combat the epidemic of prescription drug and op opioid overdose. The authorization and ASPR, reauthorization and ASPR will help states implement and improve their PDMs, which improve clinical decision making and reduce diversion. The final two bills are being considered today are the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Authorization Act and the Access to Life Saving Trauma Care for All Our Americans Act. My good friend and fellow Texan, Dr. Mike Burgess, I wish Mike was here to hear me brag about him, uh, uh, and I have led these legislative efforts. I thank him and his staff for our, their continued dedication and hard work. Both bills will reauthorize important programs that are designed to ensure the availability and effectiveness of, uh, effective use of trauma care. Trauma is leading cause of death under age 44. Federal investments in trauma centers and systems will save lives, improve patient outcomes, and provide downstream cost savings to the health care system. Again, I want to thank Dr. Burgess for his partnership on this issue and the chairman for bringing these legislative proposals before the committee today. I thank my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for their thoughtful and worthy proposals and their commitment to improving access and delivery of health care. I look forward to working on a bipartisan manner on many issues before our subcommittee, including our solutions with the ex expiration of the health centers fund in September. Unless we take action, community health centers will reduce an imme immediate 60 to 70 percent funding cut. Health centers alone are bipartisan, and, and letting the fund expire without uh, solution in place to severely limit patient access to the cost-effective primary and preventative care that provide to millions of Americans. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to my colleague from California, Lois Capps. Thank the ranking member for yielding, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important hearing today. I'm pleased to again be working with Representative Kinzinger to introduce the Vet Veteran Emergency Medical Technician Support Act, as we did in the past two Congresses, to see it up for discussion today. While our military men and women receive some of the best technical training in emergency medicine anywhere, when they return home, they are often required to start back at square one to receive the same certification for civilian jobs. At the same time, military medics with civilian credentials often must let these civilian certificates lapse while they're defending our country. Either way, this keeps our veterans out of the civilian workforce and withholds valuable medical personnel from our communities. VETS EMT is a small but straightforward bipartisan bill to help states streamline their certi certification processes to take military medic training into account for civilian licensure. I look forward to testimony today about the training these men and women have already received, the need for this bill, and the impact it could have as written or if expanded. I also must again plug my Emergency Medic Transi Transition Act, a more comprehensive bill to help develop appropriate fast-track military to community programs, which also deserves a hearing. I'm hopeful we can continue to work together in a bipartisan way to move these important pieces of legislation out of the committee so that we can help uh, these talented professionals join our health care workforce and improve the care in our communities. And I am out of time. I will yield back and thank my colleague for yielding to me. Chair, thanks. Gentlelady, now recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Upton, five minutes for opening statement.
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the last Congress, uh, this committee established an impressive record of success with 51 bipartisan bills signed into law, many of which are now helping improve public health. Families and local communities expect us to work together to solve problems, and we look forward to using our prior success as a springboard to further boost the public health that this new, uh, in this new Congress. Today, we're going to examine a half a dozen bills that collectively will help our nation's veterans address the prescription drug abuse crisis, secure access to trauma systems, and, yes, improve the Controlled Substances Act. First, we're going to hear testimony on our bill authored by Mr. Kinzinger. Uh, the Veterans Emergency Medical Technician Support Act passed by the full House in February of 2013, which would help military medics in those states with a shortage of emergency medical technicians. We also discussed the National all Schedules Prescription Electronic Reporting Reauthorization Act led by Mr. Whitfield to help address the prescription drug crisis here. We're also going to hear testimony on two trauma bills uh, led by Dr. Burgess and Ranking Member Green, the Trauma Systems Re Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act, which was passed through the full House in June of last year, would help support state and rural development trauma systems. Second bill will reauthorize language from the Public Health Service Act to fund trauma care centers. And finally, the subcommittee will hear about two bills related to the Controlled Substances Act, the Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act, led by Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Pallone, which would amend the CSA to improve and streamline the DEA's process for scheduling new drugs approved by the FDA, the Insurance Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, led by Vice Chair Blackburn and Reps Marino, Welch, and Chu, would help prevent prescription drug abuse establish clear and consistent enforcement standards, and ensure that patients have access to medications by promoting collaboration among government agencies, patients, industry stakeholders. Thank you all for being here, and I yield to Mr. Whitfield. Thank you very much. I would like to ask unanimous consent uh, to set in the record a statement from the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs and a white paper on recommendations for improving a prescription drug monitoring program. Without objection, so ordered. All right, gentlemen, yields back. Um, I would like to ask unanimous consent, since the ranking member, Ms. Plone, is not here to yield his time to Representative Kennedy. Without objection, Mr. Kennedy, you're recognized for five minutes. Opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take about 30 seconds, I hope. But um, thank you for, uh, for yielding and recognizing me. I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their testimony today, and uh, Mr. Whitfield and Mr. Pallone for their work on the NASPA reauthorization. Uh, this is an issue that is uh, particular, of particular importance for me back in my home district. At the end of 2014, there were about 209 heroin overdoses in Taunton, Massachusetts alone. In less than 20 days into 2015, there have already been 10 suspected overdoses. We can often trace the origin of those overdoses back to opioid addiction and prescription drug abuse. Tufts Healthcare Institute's Program on Opioid Risk Management released a report in 2011 with some alarming findings. They estimated that the societal cost of opioid abuse in the U.S. are substantial, with total societal costs being $55.7 billion and healthcare costs about $25 billion. The annual cost per patient diagnosed with opioid abuse, dependence, and misuse are considerably higher than those with patients without such diagnoses. I was a prosecutor for several years before uh, running for Congress. I saw the effects of opioid addiction every single day in the courtroom through property crimes, breaking and entering, uh, larcenies, and other such uh, crimes that would end up uh, drive, this addiction would drive people to uh, such lengths to break the law to try to continue to feed an addiction. Prescription drug abuse programs and prescription monitoring programs are absolutely critical uh, part to trying to come up with a comprehensive plan to combat this epidemic. And I applaud Mr. Pallone and Mr. Whitfield um, back for their efforts on this. And I'd like to yield one minute of my time back to Mr. Butterfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy, for yielding. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, for the opportunity to uh, sit in Mr. Pallone's seat for just a few minutes and to claim some of his time this morning. Uh, but, Frank, I'll be moving on in just a minute. Uh, I've got uh, one or two other places to go. Uh, but, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss a number of bipartisan bills that many of us have worked on in, in the past. In particular, I was a supporter of the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care, the Reauthorization Act, and the Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act uh, that we uh, handled in the 113th Congress. 
finding innovative ways to improve access to care in rural communities, particularly ones like mine in eastern North Carolina, can mean the difference between life and death. The ACA went a long way. It went a long way toward improving rural health care and created or reauthorized the four programs included in the Trauma Systems Act. We must reauthorize this program and put our money where our mouths are by fully funding these programs. Furthermore, the new Medical Te uh, Therapies Act uh, would improve access to care by accelerating the process to help patients access important uh, medicines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I yield back to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Butterfield. I think I yield my time, which was Mr. Pallone's time, back to Mr. Pallone. Mr. Pallone, you have two minutes left. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, say briefly that I think that uh, these six public health bills are important. They all aim to address important public health issues within our communities. I'm not going to go into all the details about them. The, uh, the first two, the Improving Regulatory Transparency Act, uh, speeds up Drug Enforcement Administration decisions on scheduling of new FDA-approved drugs and with regard to controlled substances, and the uh, second one, ensuring patient access and effective drug enforcement, uh, adds two definitions to controlled substances. Uh, the goal of that bill is to help drug distributors, pharmacies, and others work with DEA to achieve the difficult balance between keeping controlled substance prescription drugs away from drug abusers, but not from patients who need them. The next bill, the Veterans Bill, authorizes a demonstration grant program for states to streamline certification and licensure requirements for returning veterans to become emergency medical technicians. We had some great good hearings with this, and I wanted to thank Congresswoman Capps for her work on this issue. And then we have the two bills reauthorizing a number of trauma programs, which are very important uh, because traumatic injury is the leading cause of death for children and adults under the age of 45, and it's critical that states are equipped to deliver these medical services. And the last one um, the subcommittee will, will review is the NASPR bill, uh, which I co-authored with my colleague from Kentucky, Mr. Whitfield. Uh, and this legislation helps states establish and maintain prescription drug monitoring programs in order to combat drug abuses, which is an epidemic in the United States. So it's critical that we continue to support a program like this through federal funding. Many of these bills passed our committee in the House the last Congress with broad bipartisan support, as you know, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working uh, with my colleagues to do the same this year. Thanks. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. That concludes the opening statement. The members, as usual, all members' written statements, opening statements will be made a part of the record. Uh, I would like to thank the witnesses for the efforts they made to be a part of the hearing today, especially in light of the hazardous travel conditions due to wintry weather. Since we announced a one-hour delay in the start of our hearing today, one of our witnesses, Mr. John Eady, uh, has informed me that he may need to leave early because of travel constraints. But thank you for all the effort that you've made to get here. I want my colleagues to be aware uh, of this so they can form their questions with this in mind. So thank you. On our panel today, we have um, five uh, witnesses, Mr. Ben Klopek, Deputy Director of Central Jackson County Fire in Blue Springs, Missouri. Mr. John Eady, Director of Prescription Drug Monitoring Program Center of Excellence at Brandeis University. Dr. Blaine Anderson from the Department of Surgery at the University of Tennessee Medical Center. Dr. Nathan Fountain, uh, Professor of Neurology and Director of the F.E. Dreyfus Comprehensive Epilepsy Program here on behalf of the Epilepsy Foundation. And Mr. Lyndon Barber, Partner and Director of DEA Compliance Operations at Quarles and Brady. Thank you for coming today. Your written testimony will be made a part of the record. You'll be each given five minutes to summarize your testimony. Um, and Mr. Klopik, we'll begin with you. You're recognized for five minutes for your summary. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Vice Chairman Guthrie, and Mr. Green and members of the subcommittee. My name is Ben Klopik, and I'm here to discuss the issue of military medics, veterans who are honorably transitioning into the civilian EMS field. I'm representing the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians that represents roughly 40,000 plus EMTs, paramedics, 
and first responders of all delivery models, fire-based, hospital-based, privates, third services, industrial, and military medics. I currently serve on the board of directors and as the chair of the Military Relations Committee, recently re uh, retired as a deputy chief of Central Jackson County Fire and uh, sp have been a registered paramedic, nationally registered for over 30 years. I uh, also recently retired from the United States Army as lieutenant colonel and have 36 years of service in the Army starting in 1975 with one small break. Bottom line up front is we have an obstacle course when a military medic transitions from the military and tries to get a civilian EMS license. Currently, the Army and Air Force graduate their medics at the Joint Training Facility in San Antonio with a National Registry EMT card. The Navy does not. They almost meet the criteria, but the uh, medics split off at one point and get their specialty training or specialized training. Uh, we have a lot of people who are helping us with this, and it, when they have to repeat it, it's a waste of their skills. They're doing the same thing over and over. In addition, a lot of military medics gain advanced skills such as suturing and uh, doing other forms of advanced medicine that civilian medics don't. One of the biggest concerns, and it's voiced by Sergeant Major Harold Montgomery, the Senior Medical Enlisted Advisor of Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. His biggest concern is that we lose the knowledge and advances we've gained in Iraq and Afghanistan and Kosovo and don't use those, don't learn from them, and they'll be lost. These military medics that are transitioning have that ability. For example, uh, many law enforcement agencies across the country now carry uh, combat tourniquets and hemostatic agents, which have saved some lives. It's been documented by the first responders, the officers being able to use these skills. There's a shortage in rural America of paramedics, and when these medics get out, even as EMTs, they need to advance to paramedic. We've done the gap analysis. Uh, we know what needs to be done, and House Bill 235 is a great big jump in getting that achieved. It won't solve all the issues, but we've done the gap analysis. There are many states now passing legislation, over 30 at this point, to help veterans and streamline the process to become civilian medics because the state licensing procedures differ. They aren't the same. Another thing we've done is written an interstate compact, and that's being presented to the states uh, now. We need a common registry. Uh, the Senate bill would help make a solid jump to get this achieved. This is near and dear to my heart. I've deployed with fire department medics, with private medics who have gone back and tried to integrate back into their services. Some have, some haven't. Uh, the National Registry of EMTs has gone a long way towards helping the National Association of EMTs has led this charge. I had 40 medics and EMTs on one tour and worked very hard for them to keep their certification. I suffered a traumatic brain injury in 2008 in Afghanistan. It was moderate, and I still receive therapy today at the Kansas City VA, who does a great job. Uh, this... This initiative is near and dear to my heart, and I thank you for letting me speak today. God bless. <clears throat> Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Mr. Eady, you recognize five minutes for your summary. Thank you, Chairman Pitts. Oh. Thank you, Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Green, and Representative Whitfield for providing this opportunity to testify regarding proposed legislation to help fund state prescription drug monitoring programs, PDMPs, 
through the National All Schedule Prescription Electronic Reporting Act, i.e., NASPER. I am John Eady. I have worked on public health for 45 years and specifically on PDMPs for 30 years. I currently serve as director of the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program at a Center of Excellence at Brandeis University, where we identify what makes PDMPs effective and help them reach their full potential. For example, through a partnership with Pew Charitable Trusts and support from BJA, we have published a white paper on PDMP best practices. PDMPs are operating in 49 states and Guam, with another authorized for the District of Columbia. They are in, in essential ingredients in the nation's effort to reverse the epidemic of prescription opioid overdoses and deaths and rising heroin abuse. The health and safety of families across America depend on PDMPs being as effective as possible. The Center of Excellence reviews PDMPs' performance and has found that they improve clinical decision making and patient care by prescribers and pharmacies, identify and reduce doctor shopping, impact on controlled substances availability and prescribing, help improve health outcomes, reduce drug and medical costs related to inappropriate prescribing, reduce diversion into illegal use and assist drug investigations, monitor compliance and drug abstinence, assist in substance abuse treatment and medical examiner practices, assist in drug abuse prevention and surveillance efforts. Some states have recently issued broad mandates on prescribers to obtain and review PDMP data prior to issuing the first con scheduled controlled substance to each patient and periodically thereafter, for example, every three months. Kentucky, Tennessee, and New York report rapid increases in prescribers registering for PDMP use, increases in requests for PDMP data, over a 300 percent increase in Tennessee, over 500 percent in Kentucky, and over 10,000 percent in New York. Decreases in the prescribing of some commonly abused controlled substances and decreases in doctor shopping. Florida in 2011 implemented its PDMP and other initiatives. The Florida Medical Examiner has just reported for 2013 that there was an 8.3 percent decrease in one year in the number of deaths in which one or more controlled substance prescription was identified as the primary cause, while oxycodone uh, deaths declined by 27.3 percent. Further developments are needed. One example, after proactively analyzing the, their data, PDMPs should proactively send out unsolicited reports to prescribers, pharmacists, healthcare professional licensing boards, and law enforcement. This is one of the most effective best practices, but more than two-thirds of PDMPs still need to fully implement it. A second example, Medicaid, Medicare, workers' compensation, and other third-party payers need to protect their enro enrolled patients' health and safety and do so by helping prescribers and pharmacists avoid issuing and dispensing prescriptions that will cause harm to their patients. But this can only be done by PDMPs providing secure patient uh, data access to third-party payers. And this is not a common practice today. In order to reduce the opioid epidemic, PDMPs need to adopt the most effective practices, and this requires money. But the cost is minuscule compared to the price in lives and dollars if PDMPs do not rise to their full potential. The reauthorization of NASPER with proposed changes will assist states by adding important funds that complement other initiatives. States need NASPER to encourage the technological development of PDMPs' interoperability with electronic health records and health information exchanges. This development will allow PDMP data to reach prescribers and pharmacists in their normal workflow, increase clinicians' ability to properly treat their patients, and avoid prescribing or dispensing to doctor shoppers or persons counterfeiting or forging prescriptions. Importantly, NASPER can help states sustain critical PDMP operations. I thank the bill's sponsors for their efforts to improve NASPER and encourage this subcommittee on health to approve it. Thanks, gentlemen. Dr. Anderson, you're recognized for five minutes for summary. 
Chairman Pitts, Ranking Member Green and members of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing on examining public health legislation to help patients and local communities and for inviting the Trauma Center Association of America, TCAA, to speak. TCAA is a nonprofit 501c6 association representing trauma centers and systems across the country and is committed to ensuring access to life-saving trauma services. TCA, along with our advocacy partners, the American Trauma Society, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, the American College of Surgeons, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the American Burn Association, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, the College of Neurological Surgeons, the Emergency Nurses Association, the Society of Trauma Nurses, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma are on the forefront of providing trauma and emergency care to millions of Americans and it is out of that commitment that we submit these comments for your consideration. As organizations that care deeply about access to trauma and emergency care, we would like to thank you for passing the Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act, H.R. 4080, last session, and express our strong support for the passage of this vital legislation again this session. We'd also like to thank Dr. Burgess and Representative Green for the continued leadership in recognizing the importance of these systems of care and saving lives. Trauma is a major public health issue, as we've heard. In the United States, approximately 35 million are treated every year for traumatic injury. It's the leading cause of death under age 44, and at an annual cost of $67.3 billion, trauma is the third most expensive medical condition. The value proposition for trauma care is well documented. The care provided by trauma centers, including specialist physicians, nurses, and their entire trauma team has a, has a dramatic and cost-effective impact on patients' subsequent quality of life. In fact, trauma care is more cost-effective than many other interventions, including dialysis for kidney failure. Victims of traumatic injury treated at a level one trauma center are 25% more likely to survive than those treated at a general hospital. Unfortunately, 45 million Americans lack access to major trauma centers, and if, if they are taken to non-trauma centers, uh, the risk of death increases to, to 30% within 48 hours. The Trauma Systems and Regionalization of Emergency Care Reauthorization Act would reauthorize two important grant mechanisms, the Trauma Care Systems Planning Grants Program and the Regionalization of Emergency Care Pilots Program, each authorized at $12 million per year. The Trauma Care Systems Planning Grant supports state and, and rural development of trauma systems. The Regionalization of Emergency Care Pilots Program funds pilot programs to design, implement, and evaluate innovative models of regionalized emergency care. Unfortunately, in 2015, we still lack effective regionalized care systems for infectious diseases like Ebola or even for cardiac or stroke patients. The vast majority of hospitals addressing patients with these conditions also serve as our nation's regional trauma centers. These hospitals must have the tools and capabilities to care for all of these patients with emergent, time-sensitive, and life-threatening conditions, whether it's trauma, stroke, or Ebola. The funding to support these hospitals must follow and support their willingness to provide care to the sickest Americans in the greatest hour of need. In addition to the Trauma Care Systems Planning Grant and Regionalization of Emergency Care Pilots, there are two other programs contained in the Public Health Service Act set to expire this year which need to be addressed by Congress. The Access to Life-Saving Trauma Care for All Americans Act would reauthorize these vital programs to prevent more closures and improve access to trauma care. The Trauma Care Center grants are authorized at $100 million in year, per year in an effort to prevent more trauma center closures by supporting their co core missions, curtailing losses from uncompensated care, and providing emergency awards to centers at risk of closing. Also, the Trauma Service Availability Grants authorized at $100 million per year are channeled through the states to address shortfalls in trauma service and improve access to and the availability of trauma care in underserved areas. In addition, the Interagency Program for Trauma Research is in need of reauthorization. This program is designed to facilitate collaboration across the National Institutes of Health on trauma research. All of the programs are designed to ensure the availability and effective use of trauma care to save lives, co cost, and improve patient outcomes. Trauma can happen to anyone, anytime, and anywhere, as demonstrated by the Boston Marathon bombing and other recent casualties. And yet, Trauma care is not available for millions of Americans, especially in rural areas. We would in encourage the uh, 
Congress to reauthorize these vital programs to maintain trauma services for Americans in the United States. And if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to contact the uh, Trauma C Center Association of America. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Chairman. Dr. Fountain, you're recognized for five minutes for your summary. Thank you, Chairman Pitts and Ranking Member Green <clears throat> for allowing me to testify on behalf of the more than 2.8 million Americans living with epilepsy and, of course, their families. As chair of the Epilepsy Foundation's Professional Advisory Board, I'm here to support a legislative initiative that I know is important to the committee, the reintroduction of and passage of last year's Improving Regulatory Transparency for New Medical Therapies Act. The Epilepsy Foundation is extremely grateful for the committee's leadership for what we believe is an important problem that has a reasonable and workable legislative solution. The most important thing I can tell you today is that the delay caused by the lack of a timeline for the Drug Enforcement Agency in making FDA-approved drugs available to patients threatens the lives and health of Americans. The magnitude of the problem is astounding by every reasonable measure. The timeline for DEA approval has increased significantly when comparing the era of the late 90s. So if you look at the period from 1997 to 1999, compared to uh, late 2000, so 2009 through 2013. The average time between FDA approval and then DEA final scheduling of a controlled substance has increased substantially. If we look at the late 90s, it was 49.3 days, an increase then in the most recent era to 237 days. So so many days is probably more appropriate to look at it in months, so from 49 days to almost eight months. There's a particular anti-epileptic drug called FICOMPA that was approved by the FDA in 2012, but the final scheduling by the DEA occurred almost 400 days later. Now we have to talk in terms of years instead of months or days. The delay in drug approval by the DEA is addressed by this legislation. It's particularly important to people with epilepsy because epilepsy is common. It causes serious problems, including death. And previously approved epilepsy drugs that are scheduled by the DEA are not subject to abuse by any measure we can identify. So it appears that there is a delay of potentially life-saving treatments without a compelling reason. And of course, this applies equally to people with other conditions that might very well die while waiting for new drugs to be approved. So you can imagine how this would apply to someone with cancer or heart disease that's advancing while waiting for a drug to be approved. But today, I will specifically address this issue as a representative of the Epilepsy Foundation, which is the leading national voluntary health organization that speaks on behalf of the 2.8 million Americans with epilepsy. I serve as chair of our medical advisors, but I'm also a practicing neurologist at the University of Virginia and director of a large epilepsy program where I have firsthand experience with the problems caused by the delays in drug approval. I'd like to share information about epilepsy so that you can better understand why our organization is steadfast in support of this bill. Epilepsy is any condition of the brain that causes seizures. So you can imagine it has diverse causes, acquired things like head trauma or stroke, or you can be born with a genetic predisposition and otherwise be perfectly normal. Approximately one in 26 people will develop epilepsy. That's a lot of people. One in 26 people develop epilepsy at some point in their lives. The onset's greatest in childhood and in older adults. That's why epilepsy is the fourth most common neurological condition after migraine, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. Then comes epilepsy. So that might beg the question, what is a seizure for your own curiosity? Seizure is an electrical storm of the brain. The storm can be confined to just one small area of the brain and cause something as isolated as just staring and unresponsiveness or jerking of one arm, or it can involve the whole brain. The type of seizure most people are familiar with is a generalized tonic-clonic or a grand mal seizure, during which the whole brain is involved. The person becomes stiff, straightens out, falls to the ground, is unconscious, and jerks all over for a few minutes. Afterwards, their brain's entirely exhausted, and so is the person. They're unresponsive, but then, rec then they recover to normal over the course of typically about an hour. You can understand that this can cause injury from falling, choking, crashing a car, drowning. Even milder seizures that consist only of staring and confusion can cause serious problems. During confusion, people may put their hand into boiling water, thinking they're stirring it with their arm, for instance, pick up an iron by the hot face and not realize it, or be chopping vegetables and not realize it becomes part of them that they're cutting. In addition to the direct injury that seizures can cause, 
It can also result in the tragic circumstance of sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP, S-U-D-E-P, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which is the most common cause of epilepsy-related death. SUDEP occurs when someone with epilepsy dies for no obvious reason. That is, there may be evidence of a typical seizure, a seizure like I've had a hundred or a thousand times before, for instance, but there's no evidence of choking. There's no evidence of trauma or a prolonged seizure. In my last testimony to this committee, I related the story of Matthew, a delightful young uh, engineering college student who is very much like my own son, who's a college student. Matthew died from SUDEP during the time that FICAMPA was waiting to be scheduled by the DEA. They'd been approved by the FDA, had already been suggested, had been scheduled, and DEA was waiting its approval. 2,800 Americans die from SUDEP each year. For people like Matthew, waiting a year to get an effective drug to treat their seizures is not acceptable, since the drug could be life-saving. It's troubling as a patient advocacy organization as well that we can't offer a clear explanation of why the delay occurs at the DEA, since the DEA review has never made a change to the drug schedule recommended by the FDA. They've always followed FDA recommendations. Nor can we offer an explanation of why there's no timeline for DEA approval. After all, the FDA drug review process is largely transparent with predictable timelines, and our committee wonders why the DEA approval process doesn't have a similar timeline or transparency requirement. The current delays discouraging innovation in epilepsy therapy development. The unpredictable delay at the DEA means companies cannot accurately predict the amount of time they'll have left at, uh, on their drug patent or exclusivity. This bill proposes a simple solution to the problem that will ensure that drugs will not sit idly waiting to be scheduled and while patients wait for potentially life-saving drugs. We urge all members to consider full support of this legislation. Predictable and timely access to new therapies would be a phenomenal accomplishment for epilepsy patients and all Americans suffering from conditions like epilepsy. I thank the committee for its time and attention today. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Now I recognize Mr. Barber, five minutes for opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Green, members of the subcommittee. Uh, for the last three and a half years as the director of the DEA compliance and litigation practice at Quarles and Brady, I have dealt with registrants on a daily basis. But prior to that, I was the associate chief counsel at DEA. I worked at the agency for 12 years, and there I was the associate chief counsel in charge of the litigation section that took administrative actions against registrants. Over these last 15 years, we have seen a chain of well-intentioned actions and reactions by DEA and by the industry that have unintentional consequences, consequences that undermine the ability of DEA and industry to address the issue of prescription drug abuse while ensuring that there is adequate supply of controlled substances to meet the legitimate medical needs of the United States. These unintended consequences are produced in large part by a lack of clarity in the law and the uncertainty produced in the regulatory environment. The Ensuring Patient, Ac Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2015 provides much needed clarity in the Controlled Substances Act. Consider the unintended consequences that have occurred as a result of the lack of clarity. Communication between DEA and members of industry is thwarted. And communication is the cornerstone of a regulatory environment that promotes compliance and collaboration, particularly in an area like prescription drug abuse, an area that changes frequently and is difficult for DEA and industry to detect those who are attempting to obtain controlled substances for an illicit purpose. This breakdown has led to a lack of access to controlled substances for certain patients. It's order, altered the ordering patterns of pharmacies, making it more difficult for DEA and members of the supply chain to detect suspicious orders. And there is growing evidence to suggest that these actions and reactions are contributing to the rise in heroin use. When patients with chronic pain are forced to go from pharmacy to pharmacy in search of a pharmacist who will dispense a controlled substance that the patient has taken for years to control legitimate pain, we have a problem. When a pharmacist fears that filling such a prescription will result in being second-guessed by DEA and having their DEA registration suspended, we have a problem. When wholesale distributors decide to limit the supply of narcotics to pharmacies simply to avoid the risk of regulatory action, we have a problem. And certainly if the lack of supply of controlled substances leads some people to use heroin, 
as some of the recent evidence suggests, we have a problem. That is why clarity in the law is so important. H.R. 471 provides clarity in a way that will allow DEA and industry to address these unintended consequences. While addressing these unintended consequences is essential, it is also important to preserve DEA's ability to issue immediate suspensions to address imminent danger to public health and safety. The lack of clarity and an inconsistent approach to immediate suspensions over the last 40 years has led to judicial challenges of DEA's authority. In 2006, when I was the Associate Chief Counsel at DEA, the agency stopped issuing immediate suspensions uh, because of a federal court ruling that found that the DEA had process for immediate suspensions was unconstitutional. During an eight-month period, while the Internet pharmacies were out of control, fueling prescription drug abuse, the agency issued no immediate suspensions. That is exhibit A for why clarity in the law and protecting DEA's authority is so important. Clarity also promotes access to controlled medications for patients. Without clarity, registrants often act to reduce re perceived regulatory risk. A pharmacist refuses to fill legitimate prescriptions for narcotics simply because dispensing a high volume of narcotics brings scrutiny from DEA and from the wholesale distributor. No one wants cancer patients, wounded veterans, those in chronic pain to go without medication, but restricting access is an unintended consequence of a regulatory environment that lacks clarity. The Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2015 holds the promise of fulfilling its name. By defining key terms in the CSA, the regulatory and enforcement environment will be clarified. Communication between DEA and registrants will be enhanced. Registrants will be less likely to restrict access to legitimate patients out of a fear that they may be second-guessed by DEA. Registrants will also be encouraged to assist DEA in detecting controlled substance diversion. And DEA's authority to issue immediate suspensions will be protected from judicial curtailment because there will be a clear legal standard. I thank the chairman and the committee. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. I will uh, begin questioning and recognize myself five minutes for that purpose. Dr. Fountain, in your testimony, you mentioned that the DEA has no set timeline or transparency requirements when making scheduling determinations. How does this impact patients, particularly those who have not benefited from currently available therapies? About one-third of people with epilepsy will continue to have seizures despite uh, available treatments. For those third of patients, every new therapy is vitally important because the incidence of SUDEP, sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, seems to be related to the number of seizures, logically. So for those patients who are most severely affected, they're in most need of new therapies. And those new th the sooner those new therapies are available, the sooner that their seizures can be reduced in frequency, the less likely they're going to die as well as suffer those other consequences. So of course the epilepsy community, the Epilepsy Foundation wants to have safe and effective drugs. That's paramount. But if the FDA has already determined them to be safe and effective, then for our community it's difficult to understand why it would be delayed at the FDA, I mean at the DEA, while waiting to be scheduled. So it can impact patients very directly. Now, give me the length of time, the longest. Uh, time patients have had to wait on DEA after FDA has conducted its own detailed abuse liability analysis and approved a new therapy? I think based on the analysis that's uh, been done in the published literature, the drug I mentioned before, Ficampa, I think is the longest time, and it was 400 days. So 400 days after FDA approval was when the drug was finally made available, scheduled, uh, and finally scheduled by the DEA. So uh, about approximately 400 days, more than a year. Do you know of any widespread abuse or criminal diversion of epilepsy treatments? I'm not aware of a single case report. So I've done my own literature search of the medical literature, and I'm, I'm not aware of even a single case report of abuse of what we would consider standard epilepsy drugs. It's true in <coughs> epilepsy we sometimes, in special circumstances, use uh, other drugs that might be subject to uh, control, so-called benzodiazepines, that have a different role. But for normal epilepsy drugs, the ones that have been approved in the recent many decades, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, actual abuse. 
Uh, Mr. Klopik, um, both the GAO and the IOM have addressed the need of the EMS system in the U.S. Two of the areas of need, personnel and training, were highlighted. Since those reports were issued, there have been several events that have reinforced the need for a highly trained, effective, responsive EMS system, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, pandemics. Do you see this bill as another way of improving preparedness? Chairman Fitz, absolutely. Uh, this bill will help take a trained and um, a, a trained group of medics and transition them so they take care of the shortfall. They're more able to help in disasters. They're more able to help with protection of a license or certification in incidents like Boston or Katrina and can go from state to state. Now, if you were making recommendations to the states to streamline the process for veterans to become EMTs, what would you focus on? Edu approving education programs, the training centers and education facilities to offer something similar to Lansing Community College in Michigan uh, that sits down with the veteran and looks at their electronic military training record and gives them credit, transcripts credit for that at no cost, and then fills the gap and gets them out within a few weeks or a weekend. Okay. Mr. Eady, you mentioned that there's a white paper that describes best practices PDMPs need to adopt. Yes, sir. It's available on our, the website of the, at pdmpexcellence.org. And it is the, that is the website for the uh, PDMP Center of Excellence at Brandeis University. Could yes. you highlight a few of the practices you think are important to improve PDMPs? Absolutely. Uh, for, I would first comment that there are 35 best practices listed, so it comes, deals with everything from the way data is collected from pharmacies right through how the data is used. In terms of the data use, the uh, recent advent of um, the mandated uh, use of the systems by prescribers has certainly proven to be very effective in the states that have already initiated that, and I mentioned the examples of that in my earlier comments. Uh, the the uh, major one that uh, is has yet to be fully implemented is the the use of unsolicited reporting or uh, proactive reporting called both the proactively states uh, analyze the data that's in their system and then share it with those people who need to see it based upon what the analysis shows. Uh, to date, uh, only about a third of states are covering that, doing that adequately. And uh, so there's a great deal of room there. Uh, there are other things like the, uh, the, the excellent effort that's underway to uh, allow data to be shared through electronic health records and health information exchanges. That's a, a technological fix, so to speak, that will allow the prescribers and pharmacists to get data faster and right within their normal workflow so they can review it more readily. Thank you. My time's expired. The chair recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Green, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to focus my questions on the two trauma-related bills that Dr. Burgess and I have introduced. And <clears throat> Dr. Burgess is actually chairing another subcommittee of our full Energy and Commerce Committee downstairs. Uh, both bills would reauthorize a number of important programs aimed at strengthening trauma systems, developing regionalized systems of care, and improving the availability of high-level trauma services. Dr. Anderson. It's a disappointing fact that 44 million Americans currently lack access to the major trauma centers within the golden hour of the injury, the time period when the chances of survival are greatest. Can you elaborate on the issue of access and why timely and appropriate care within the first hour of injury is so critical? Traumatic injury is a surgical disease. Basically, the injuries that kill patients when they're injured are frequently they're bleeding to death and they need access to surgical care within that time to stop the uh, the dying process while they're bleeding. The access problems occur commonly in, in the United States in rural areas, but we also have access problems in some of our major cities where there's a maldistribution of level one trauma centers. So someone who's injured on one side of a city has problems getting transported to that trauma center 
in the length of time and before they bleed to death. And if they're taken to a hospital that's not part of the system, that, that delays the care until they reach that definitive surgical care. Thank you. Um, I represent uh, Houston, Texas, and uh, I first became involved in this issue when, uh, uh, when Hurricane Allison, or Tropical Storm Allison, flooded our two level one trauma centers in our medical center. And, um, and there it was underwater. While tropical storms and hurricanes are not typically the greatest threat to trauma centers operations, cost pressures, provider shortages have caused many trauma centers to close and many more struggling to maintain operations. As you mentioned, your testimony from 1990 to 2005, 30 percent of our trauma centers closed their doors. Can you discuss why access to trauma care is threatened by losses associated with the high cost of treating severely injured patients, a problem compounded by uncompensated care and the growing shortage of trauma-related physicians? The, uh, the costs just keep going up. The, the demands on, on uh, providers are, are increasing. And if we close down trauma centers, that just puts a further strain on the system. In many areas, such as our area, we are the only trauma center in our area, uh, and we don't have any backup. And, and the fewer trauma centers you have, they're more likely to get overloaded with all of the patients so that when they're needed for critical events, they can't provide care for their patients. So it is nice to have some redundancy in that system, but that's, that redundancy has to make sense. It has to be in places where they can work with the higher level trauma centers, where they can take care of the patients and, and provide the, the care that's needed in that region and for those injured patients. And I want to point out that some of these programs have not received funding for several years. They have not. They've been authorized, but they've not had appropriations. Dr. Anderson, what can you talk about the value in investing in trauma centers and trauma care programs like these? We've heard that, that trauma is the leading cause of death in, in patients under the age of 44. If you have young patients who are injured and you treat them and get them back to normal life, they can return to a long working life for society. As an example, uh, we recently had a uh, young man, he, had, he was at work, he got ill, he was driving home, he had a bad wreck, he had terrible injuries, he had uh, ruptured uh, thoracic aorta, he had extremity fractures, he had a head injury, and yet by getting brought quickly to our trauma center, we were able to treat those injuries over a period of time, and in six months he was back working and back with his family. Well, and Mr. Chairman, I realize that a lot of us uh, have been to both Iraq and Afghanistan, and that was the same goal that we had for our military, to make sure that there was a, uh, within that hour period, they could reach uh, a trauma center, whether it be in Kabul, um, Kandahar in Afghanistan, or in, in Baghdad, or Balad in, uh, in Iraq. So, uh, the, uh, Mr. Anderson, can you talk about the value of investing in trauma systems and tra trauma care programs like these? I think the value is simply what you pointed out. So in the military, they have a great regionalized system where they provide life-saving care at the scene. They quickly transport to a place to, for more definitive care, and then they transfer them back to the United States for rehabilitation. What we need is a system that involves all levels of trauma care so that we can take our young people and return them to a normal life. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, I yield back my time except I want to thank Dr. Burgess for his partnership and leadership and also thank the Trauma Coalition who's worked hard on the reauthorization of these programs. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questioning. Uh, Mr. Reedy, uh, I'm from Kentucky, and we have been very active in this area. Uh, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, as of July 13th, or July 2013, 47 states had operational prescription drug monitoring plans, or PDMPs. However, they're significantly underutilized by providers. A number of factors contribute to this underutilization, including the cumbersome nature of, this, of accessing current systems and privacy concerns. Would you elaborate on some of the factors that may lead to underutilization of PDMPs? I certainly am happy to do that. Uh, and I want to acknowledge Kentucky's leadership for the country on this, on many issues, including this one. Uh, the, in many cases, the cumbersome nature of this process, as you describe it, is correct, as a, doctors have to take the time to do it. A recent development in Kentucky and other states has been to actually allow the physicians to delegate the responsibility to a subordinate person in the practice with the prescriber keeping responsibility. That is also a practical thing that can be done, and we encourage every state to look at that 
in it. And in fact, those states that have mandated use have found it essential because of the increased workload of having to, to pull up the data. I want to ask you on the mandate. Do you, do you yes. think that's the right approach to mandate the use? Kentucky, I think New York, I know my state has, and also the state of New York. Yes. Uh, what, uh, Will you elaborate on mandating? Yes. What, what those mandates, there are mo multiple types of mandates out there. Some, like the state of Nevada, which mandates that prescribers use a system, but only when they have a reason to believe that the patient in front of them is not there for legitimate medical purposes. Uh, such states have not significantly increased their use of the data by prescribers with that kind of a mandate. Mm -hmm. But Kentucky, New York, and, and Tennessee have pioneered a new one in which basically every patient is required, with a few logical exceptions, when the prescribe before the first prescription is issued, and then periodically thereafter. And in the case of Kentucky, it's at least every three months. They have to check the, uh, when before issuing an additional prescription beyond three months. What that does is it allows a prescriber in each case to check. We know from work that uh, we did with uh, the state of Massachusetts that in that state, when these unsolicited reports I talked about were sent out, and they sent uh, to prescribers, and then we, uh, with them, did a survey, found that only 8% of the prescribers acknowledged after receiving those reports that they had known about the uh, multiple doctor episodes or doctor shopping that was going on by their patients. Or more than, uh, putting it the other way, more than 90% of the prescribers did not know what was going on and therefore would not have asked for the data had it not been uh, sent to them. Or in the case of a mandate, they have to look, which is why they are effective. And we've seen uh, in Kentucky and, in fact, in all three of those states that medical opposition at first to being required to use the system has modified itself after implementation. Okay, I'm going to try to get another question in on from another panelist. I appreciate that. That was very helpful. appreciate what, what you're saying. Mr. Kalpik, um, when you were talking about your, the, the situation, you said there are a lot of people helping and involved in working in this. And so I have two questions, really. I'll ask because we have a minute and a half. Who are the stakeholders that you that are should be addressing this and giving us information for policy questions? And you also said H HR 235 will address issues, but there's still a lot of other issues to be addressed. You talk about state licensing and understand how that, you know, with each state having its own and us reluctant to get into that uh, because that state's issue. Um, would be a problem. What other issues besides just state license and do you think maybe other legislation would, would help? So who are the stakeholders and what other issues need to be addressed? Vice Chairman Gut Guthrie, uh, other issues are standardization of training at the Joint Services Medical Training Facility in San Antonio. If we could get all of those folks with the National Registry EMT card, that would really help as they try to transition out. Um, other issues, uh, HR 235 mainly helps with providing some funds for educational facilities to develop their transition program, especially in the rural or, or shortage areas. Um, other issues are standardization of state licenses. If there was a national registry, that would really help us. Um, many states accept the registry now, but all don't. Um, that's, you know, I used that's, to be a state legislator. It probably would be easy for states to adopt rules if, if it came out with a standard uniform service. As you said, if the uniform services would have a standard training program with a standard card or standard criteria, then it would be easy for states to. So maybe that's one where we start. But uh, my time's actually expired. I appreciate Thanks. you doing so. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'd like to recognize Mr. Schrader from Oregon for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, first question for uh, Mr. Eady. Uh, curious, as you've heard uh, testified by uh, uh, Mr. Whitfield, that we currently have a uh, program, a registry, if you will, that's operated out of the DOJ unit, and wondered uh, what the advantages of uh, or need for a unit out of HHS uh, would be and why that's critical for making this program work effectively. I appreciate your question. It is my experience that both law enforcement and the public health professions have to be involved in addressing these issues. Neither one can ad address it. I mean, a fundamental thing is that prescriptions are issued by healthcare professionals, and the entire system of delivery of opioids, for example, are, th uh, are through the healthcare system. So a public health involvement 
and regulatory involvement involving health care is essential. At the same time, these, uh, as long as we've had these types of drugs available for medical use, which is so important, they've also had the risk of, being, of making people addicted. And when that happens, people move into all sorts of illegal and criminal behavior patterns, and including um, forgeries, counterfeitings, organized rings of drug shoppers, et cetera, and pill mills. Those are outside the realm that can be dealt with and addressed effectively by traditional public health entities. I, and I give you simply the examples. The public health, if you look at seatbelts, that's a triumph basically of both public health and law enforcement working together. It, the simple thing of people being quarantined in a public health emergency, in an epidemic, public health orders it, law enforcement enforces it. Very good. And I could go on. But my point is that both aspects are essential, and you cannot, we cannot hope to solve this epidemic if we don't keep both parts working together. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barber, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, uh, the lack of clarity in the DEA guidelines, particularly as it affects distributors, and, and talk about the def why the definition of imminent, imminent danger is so important and modifying the corrective action is important also. Yes, sir. Uh, th the statute at currently uh, does not have a definition for imminent danger. Uh, unlike other federal statutes designed to protect public health and safety, such as the Mine Safety Act, uh, when uh, an attorney, when an agent for DEA is faced with making a decision about uh, whether or not to, prior to a hearing, to issue an immediate suspension, uh, which brings due process rights to bear, uh, the question is, what constitutes an imminent danger? Uh, in my written testimony, I cite an example where uh, DEA has issued a suspension for conduct that they knew had ceased uh, for months. And uh, so it is those types of scenarios that create a lack of clarity about what the standard is that will lead to an, a, an immediate suspension. Uh, and that is why courts have at times intervened and going back to the year after DEA was created in 1974, all the way to as recently as 2013, courts have questioned and in many cases overturned suspensions issued by the agency because of that lack of clarity. And as far as the corrective action plan, uh, that, that is uh, an important piece of the legislation in that it, it provides an assurance to a registrant who has taken corrective action that that will be taken into account thereby enhancing collaboration and communication with the agency. Uh, there are times where registrants get it wrong and the agency needs to take action, but if the agency is ta or the registrant has taken corrective action, it's appropriate for the agency to consider that. Very good. Thank you. Um, Mr. An Anderson, uh, could you talk very briefly about uh, what the benefits are uh, with regard to regionalization? What, the, what does that translate into? What does that really mean? What regionalization really means is that all of the parts of, of a system uh, work together, and it may be under one head. So uh, you have a level one trauma center, you may have other trauma centers, you have other hospitals, but there's a system set up to ensure that the right patient gets to the right place at the right time, and they all work together. In the past, we've talked about exclusive trauma s systems where you just have one center. Now we talk about inclusive trauma centers. You want everyone involved so they know what their role is in making sure that the patient gets to the right place. So they can get the immediate care they need, no matter what. A, the immediate care, so there's not delays. If, they, if they're closer to another hospital, there's not a delay there. They're, they're, there's ways set up to automatically get the patient to where they need to be. Very good. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Yield back. The gentleman yields back, recognizes Mr. Griffith of Virginia for five minutes for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Fountain, if you could uh, talk a little bit about uh, where you think we ought to go with, uh, in regard to the DEA and, and how we can better improve that process. I know the bills we have here today, but are there other things that we can be doing as a committee to assist in uh, making sure that we uh, get some action on those things that have already been approved by the DEA or maybe even some research into things that we know might help epileptic uh, patients that uh, we're not able to do studies on yet? I guess there are two other DEA-related issues that are important to the epilepsy community and to Americans in general. One of them peculiar to epilepsy drugs is that although they're scheduled by the FDA, they're scheduled at a low level, 
and since there's and for administrative reasons they have been scheduled because the FDA when it makes a recommendation the DEA follows eight specific criteria and if these eight specific criteria boxes are checked off then it requires DEA to schedule it but those boxes while they're perfectly reasonable for instance if a drug is approved in a class of drugs in which that class of drugs is already regulated then the DEA is forced to schedule it well for epilepsy drugs because of historical reasons they're in those classes so they end up getting scheduled by the DEA but from a medical perspective uh, it's sort of uh, somewhere between unbelievable and comical because they aren't the kind of drugs that you would typically regulate like that. So that physicians who are not epilepsy physicians would always ask the question, well, why is that a regulated drug? So specifically for our community and maybe for other drugs regulated by the DEA, especially given the burden that the DEA has dealing with these specific and important issues we've been addressing, it might be reasonable to revisit for epilepsy drugs, but perhaps other drugs, speaking for myself, that don't necessarily need to be regulated by the DEA. And there may be some drugs that do need to be d regulated by the DEA, but maybe we need to take a look at, at how they're regulated. Uh, currently, I'm working on some language with the uh, epilepsy folks in regard to uh, figuring out a way that we can use the cannabinoid oil uh, from the marijuana plant. Of course, it's hard to figure out how much cannabinoid oil and how much THC you need to make it work for the children who apparently, at least anecdotally, it appears that is a, a uh, treatment plan for some patients. Uh, but we haven't had a lot of studies done over the years by the DEA, would you agree? That's right. So the other uh, issue relevant to the epilepsy community and to those with severe medical conditions is regulation of cannabis derivatives and cannabidiol, which is one derivative of uh, marijuana that doesn't cause a high, doesn't cause euphoria or anything like that, seems to have some effectiveness in treating seizures and a few other medical conditions and is not the part of the plant or the compound that typically associated with drug abuse, THC is, and uh, so consequently for the epilepsy community, we'd like to find a way to have cannabidiol oil available to those, first of all, to be studied and have research to know it's safe and effective, but then beyond that, to make it available to people uh, with the most severe epilepsies in certain circumstances. And we definitely want to go in, in, in that direction, but also make sure, because clearly that is a drug that can be abused, and we want to make sure that we don't overlook that when we, uh, when we go down that path. Mr. Barber, I, I know you sometimes get on the hot seat in here because we're trying to get things uh, accomplished and get new treatments out there, and at the same time, you're trying to make sure we don't have a lot of abuse of, of drugs. Uh, when last we were here and discussing these items, I, I had a situation where a small-town pharmacy, you know, couldn't do what they can do. You mentioned that in your opening statement, and I appreciate that, that you felt like we needed to try to make a better system so that we didn't have those problems where small-town pharmacies and with one supplier might have these issues. Do you have any suggestions that you can think of that we can do to be of assistance in that? Is there legislation that we need to pass that we haven't thought of yet or, or aren't moving on? I believe the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective uh, Drug Enforcement Act of 2015 is a great step in the right direction. I, I do think that there are certainly oversight roles that committees such as this can play. Uh, for example, uh, DEA's regulation calls on distributors to detect and report suspicious orders to DEA. Those are, according to the regulations, orders of unusual size, unusual frequency, or those that deviate substantially from a normal ordering pattern. What is unusual depends on the context of the ordering pharmacy. Right. What deviates substantially is somewhat amorphous, and so if there is greater clarity around regulatory obligations like that, it will help pharmacies who now find themselves oftentimes not having sufficient drug supply to meet the needs of their patients. And if, I'm gonna, if I can take just a minute, Mr. Chairman, and, and just say I, I understand what he's saying. If I'm translating it correctly, what that means is if you have a pharmacy that serves a lot of older people who are more likely to have pain needs, uh, a senior population, than a pharmacy that serves a younger, you, you can't have a one-size-fits-all for the pharmacy that's in a community that's younger and a pharmacy that's in a community that's substantially older and is going to have more pain issues. Is that fair translation? That, that, that is a fair translation. Context always matters, both in the law enforcement and health care arena. I appreciate it. Appreciate the panel being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Sarbanes from Maryland for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't take uh, five minutes. First, let me thank the panel for being here. You, most of you have come from 
great distances to share your expertise with us, and it's deeply appreciated by, by the committee. Uh, Mr. Chlapik, is that how I pronounce? It's Klopik, sir. Klopik, sorry. Um, I gather you were here to testify primarily with respect to the Helping Veterans with Emergency Medical Training yes, sir. proposal, which I think is a terrific opportunity to showcase how we can streamline bringing providers of all kinds, frankly, um, more quickly into the into the healthcare workforce. I've been working for many years on this idea of looking in non-traditional places for people that can help meet some of the shortages we have, whether that's physicians um, or nurses, or in this case, um, EMTs, and looking at military medics who obviously come with a vast amount of experience uh, for that um, resource makes a tremendous amount of sense and seeing if there's ways that we can streamline the uh, process for actually getting them deployed you know here um, in the homeland to help respond to these emergencies uh, makes a lot of sense so this demonstration project that um, that Adam Kingsinger and, and uh, Congresswoman Caps have proposed I think makes um, could make a, a, a tremendous amount of difference um, I was just curious whether you've yet had the opportunity, I imagine you have, to work with some EMT uh, professionals who are former uh, military medics and what's your, what your observation has been as to the kind of um, expertise and experience um, that they bring to the job. It's an. It depends, sir. Uh, you have the special forces or or SEAL or PJ medic that's deployed forward that does a whole lot of different things. Uh, puts chest tubes in, uses conscious sedation, and and some other uh, adjuncts. These folks can come out and go. They should be able to challenge the paramedic test right away. Mm -hmm. And I'll get phone calls that say, that ask, what can I do from these medics? And so I try to link them up with an educational institution that will let them do a weekend refresher and then challenge the test through their institution. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Well, that, that's a good perspective. And um, I think what they can bring to a team, to an EM, EMT team on the ground, given their uh, experience and and uh, uh, perspective is incredibly valuable. Um, in other words, it's not just another source of finding people for this job. It's finding people that are particularly um, qualified in certain respects for the job, and that's why I support the uh, uh, this bill in particular. So thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate it, and all of it. Gentleman yields back. Next recognized is Mr. Long from Missouri for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Klopik, number one, it's nice to have a fellow Missourian here. So uh, welcome. And uh, can you kind of walk us through the traditional state credentialing or licensing process for EMTs? Yes, sir. And the military EMTs or the civilian EMTs, Mr. Long? Well, the traditional just... Uh, Civilian is what I'm getting at. Civilian EMTs normally, for the basic course, go through a one semester or roughly six month time period with uh, two clinical shifts and then take the, the test. The state of Missouri, for example, as well as about 40 other states, have adopted the National Registry exam because it takes a lot of pressure off of them. It's standardized. It's vetted, and they'll take that exam and then receive a license. For paramedics, they go anywhere from two to three semesters and do in excess of 600 to 700 clinical hours, uh, both in a hospital and in an ambulance. And then once they do a certain number of skills, they're allowed to, uh, to move on. Okay, can you kind of juxtapose that with the military training for someone with previous training, such as a military medic uh, in Missouri, would they be qualified as EMT basic or EMT intermediate or EMT paramedic? 
the military medics, uh, for the most part, that go through the program at San Antonio at the Joint Training Facility qualify. If they're in the Army or the Air Force, they'll have a National Registry card. They present that to most states, and they're handed a state license to work um, within that state. The Special Forces medics come in, and they're expected... They've done everything to qualify to test for a paramedic level card. Um, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It depends. A, a Navy SEAL medic retired after 22 years and went to L.A. County Fire, and he wound up going through their whole paramedic course again. Hmm. But it was one of the few things he could do that really satisfied him after the job he had been doing. Uh I know there's EMT shortages, and uh, would you characterize that problem? Is it a problem of recruitment or a problem of retention or both? It, both along with pay. EMS is severely underfunded, especially in rural areas, and some of these folks either volunteer or work for about $15,000 a year. If they're paramedic level, they can make fifty to sixty, or a little more. Um, there's a huge difference, and it's underfunded. Okay, so I was going to ask how you think that state health care systems could keep qualified EMTs working in the field, but I think you kind of answered that. Yes, sir. Okay, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman, yield, gentleman yields back. Next recognized is Mr. Bashan of Indiana for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, prior to coming to Congress, I was a cardiovascular and thoracic surgeon for 15 years, so uh, I'm pretty familiar with the subject matter of, especially as it relates to trauma and all, really all the medical issues, including EMT and how you deal with uh, pharmacies and uh, what the process is. And I just would like to say at the top that this is a huge problem. My, my law enforcement in my community in Evansville, Indiana, recently told me that prescription drug issues have overtaken methamphetamine as a uh, community health problem in, in our county. And that, I think, uh, is probably widespread across the country. And, uh, uh, Mr. Eady, your comments about combining law enforcement and medical are very, are very critical. Uh, I can tell you as a practicing physician, one of the, one of the uh, issues is time and, informa and the information in an expedient manner. Uh, most physicians, a as you know, 99.9% .9 don't want to prescribe narcotics to people that are doctor shopping. Um, but available information quickly is, is so critical if we can provide that. As a surgeon, of course, I, you know, I provided acute medical care, acute pain management, which is a completely different area than our primary care physicians or neuro neurologists and others have to uh, have to deal with. Um, so maybe you can expand further on how, how you think, you know, I mean, getting the information from medical records. For example, the two ho major hospital systems in, in Evansville have two EMR systems that don't communicate with each other. And the medical practices have... Uh, some of the medical practices have EMR systems that don't communicate with either hospital. Um, yeah, how, I mean, how do, how do we make progress uh, in that area? Because I know that there's a lot of smart IT professionals that could probably fix this problem overnight, right? But it's about proprietary information. It's about economics. It's about profit uh, for different systems, and I totally understand that. But how, how do we get past that and really get the physicians the information immediately so that they, they on the prescribing side, we don't over-prescribe. Uh, thank you for your question, and I, wa I want to also acknowledge that uh, I would be happy to put you in contact with the people in Indiana who are experimenting with this. There is a trial underway in Indiana. You're one of the 16 states where there's an effort being made to f translate PDMP data directly into the existing systems of, of electronic health records and health information exchanges. And I, the details of that, they would have to provide to you. 
but it is important work. And that's why we support the NASPER. It's one of the major reasons we support NASPER is that, and feel it's so important is that we've seen the value and the importance of doing exactly what you're talking about. And these 16 states have started, but that's not nearly enough. And they've got a long way to go. They're just experimenting. NASPER funding uh, has, in its refocused form, in the new legisl in the redrafted legislation uh, would really encourage this. It would provide funding to support states to do the necessary work. And it's going to take time. You, the, the complications of proprietary systems, multiple systems in each state, it's, it's going to take a while to overcome those barriers and hurdles that have been put in place by multiple systems. But, they, but it is doable. And there's a n real na national effort underway, which, uh, and in fact, the substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, or SAMHSA, is the one that's uh, spearheading this effort uh, with the uh, uh, Office of the, uh, from the White House on, on technological developments for health care. There's a lot of work that's been done, and I would be very happy to put you in touch with them to learn about that. That would be great. And, of, of course, the, the medical systems need to be able to communicate with pharmacies and, and, the, and honestly, with law enforcement also. Um, in, in some way, and it's, so it's a complicated problem. But my wife's an anesthesiologist still practicing, so she tells me every day the, the number of patients that come to uh, the hospital for other procedures that are on, uh, have been taking narcotics or honestly benzodiazepines yes. for many, many years. This is, a, this is really an epidemic problem, and it, it, it hits. And it's a cross socioeconomic class. It's, a, yes. it's something I've been working on since I've been in Congress in the state on the methamphetamine issue, trying to solve that. Yes. Uh, but now the prescription drug issue, is, is, it has been and, and is surpassing that. Um, so I can tell you firsthand, you know, the significance. And I appreciate all your testimony and everyone working towards uh, solutions to solve the problem. And on the EMT side, uh, quickly, Mr. Chairman, last, uh, the last Congress we were able to get a legislation passed on commercial driver's license for veterans who had driving experience in the military, uh, making that stream a streamlined process so that they could get a, a commercial driver's license to dr drive a semi, for example, across the country and uh, because of their military experience. Very, I think so. I do think there's a good chance that this legislation will move forward and become law, and I hope it does. So I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, report the prescription opiate and heroin crisis a public health approach to an epidemic of addiction. That objection. That objection so ordered. The chair now recognizes Mr. Collins from New York for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has been a great hearing. I think, first of all, Mr. Klopchek, we all agree anything we can do to help our vets coming back, uh, we want to do. Are there, uh, and while this may not be a lot of money per year, a couple hundred thousand per year, I understand, that is what's been requested. Uh, do you know how many states have this issue? I mean, one of the requirements is a state uh, claim a shortage of EMTs and, and there's a need. Do you happen to know, is this two or three states or 10 or 15? You know, how great is the need for, for what we're proposing here? Nearly every state that has a rural area has uh, a shortage in those areas. They were previously, or they're currently served by volunteers. But as more and more folks uh, go back into the city for work, and both members of the household work, um, and requirements keep increasing for the mobile health care providers, the folks on the street, EMS professionals, uh, they can't keep people at all. And veterans are coming out. They know how to be on time for work. They know how to follow orders. And they just need help with the license. Um, Illinois is a prime example. And uh, Carl, uh, out in Champaign-Urbana, has a conference every year on rural health care. EMS is the big thing. Well, I, I know this has bipartisan support. And we won't know until uh, we get this approved and appropriated just how many folks are going to uh, apply for it, but uh, certainly a worthy objective, and, and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, my other question really is for Dr. Anderson on the, uh, uh, the trauma piece. First of all, I'm just curious, do we know since this one's at reauthorization in the last couple of years, um, how many hospitals have applied and, and what's, 
the average amount of money they're getting and have we seen a report that tracks how this money has uh, allowed us to either get new trauma centers or keep trauma centers open? In other words, what are the metrics coming back at us? Well, so unfortunately, th these have been authorized over the past several years, but have, there have been no appropriations for that. Um, okay. So. Uh, I'm glad you've brought that up as well as an authorizing committee, but not the appropriators. That's uh, information I didn't know as a new member, and, and uh, I'm glad to hear that, or, and I'm glad to know that so we, we can move forward. Certainly, the, the access to trauma, as we've talked about, that golden hour is critical. And I represent the Western New York area, and Erie County Medical Center has got one of the best level four or level one trauma centers in the country. And it is quite expensive to set that up. And uh, I know it's always the issue with the county government and others of tight budget times deciding, you know, where this money goes. Uh, but it's a, a lifesaver, quite literally, whether it's the ski resorts that are 60 miles away and the incidents there, which tend to be uh, head trauma and the like, uh, that, that excess uh, has, has saved many lives in Western New York. And I know we're blessed to have that. I know it's a, it's a very much of a cost burden, but, uh, you know, we've decided as a community it's, it's worth that money. Um, w would you see that, you know, something like in the one I'm explaining, they're existing, they're there, the community's behind them. Would they qualify for one of these grants, or is this really more focused on assuming it gets appropriated, those areas that don't have one now? Uh, both. So, so part of it applies to trauma centers that exist, especially trauma centers that are having significant difficulty and are in danger of closing. We're trying to prevent that. But we're also trying to uh, help states look at the models of trauma care that they have, make sure that they're allocating the resources the way that makes sense. So in a regionalized system, these, as you pointed out, are very expensive resources. You don't want every hospital duplicating those resources. So you have to understand how it works best in a system, know how it works and how that system can work together to take uh, take care of their patients. Yeah, I mean, the good news for Erie is we did designate the Erie County Medical Center as the level one trauma center. The other hospitals recognize that. It's also the regional and in many cases, that, that one hour works with our Mercy flight, the helicopters coming in. You know, I, I suspect we're probably an example of best practices, both in the type of facility and also uh, uh, the, the way the other hospitals recognize that that's our designated trauma center. Absolutely. So, again, a very important issue. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yield back my remaining five seconds. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from... Tennessee is recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you all for being here, especially Dr. Henderson, my fellow Tennessean, and we're delighted to have him here and with us today. Mr. Chairman, I've got some things to submit for the record. Uh, first of all, the statement of the National Association of Chain Drug Stores on today's hearing. And secondly, letters of support for the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act of 2015, which is the work product of Ms. Chu, Mr. Welch, Mr. Marino, and I. Um, these are from the American Pharmacist Association, the Healthcare Distribution Management Association, the National Association of Chain Drug Stores, and the National Community Pharmacist Association. Okay, no objection. Go on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quickly, as we wrap up, uh, I did have a couple of questions on H.R. 471, which is the Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act. Uh, Mr. Barber, you mentioned in your remarks to one of the questions that context matters, and I appreciate hearing that. So I uh, wanted to go back to your testimony. You said that little has changed in the past year in regard to the issue of dealing with the DEA and guidance. And I want to know, has there been any improvement in the guidance the DEA is giving to distributors and pharmacists on this issue? It hasn't changed. So I, I would say there's been no improvement or, or any decrement. It, it's unchanged. Well, I was hoping there was a sliver of a, a step in the right direction, but I guess not, and it shows why we need to go ahead and get this bill passed. Um, 
I wanted to also ask you, uh, we hear some discussion about whether or not to define imminent danger. And I would like for you briefly to touch on why giving definition to imminent danger would benefit the DEA. Well, I, as a former counsel who appeared in federal courts, assisted U.S. Attorney's Office in defending the suspension power of the agency, having a clear legal standard is always best. There are federal statutes that were passed around the same time as the CSA that contain a definition of imminent danger. And rather than having it undefined and having courts second guess the agency's important power, uh, to me it seems like if Congress gave a clear standard in the law, then the agency could enforce it and, and courts would not be left to second guess DEA. Okay, so you would say the harm comes in having no definition of the imminent danger. I, I believe that is the harm. It, it is a harm both to the agency and to the regulated community who doesn't know where the lines are, and we have those in unintended consequences I mentioned in Thank my Thank you. And, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, we're speaking in uh, reference to the Controlled Substance Act. Well, I know you all are ready to uh, step away from uh, uh, the desk, and we are appreciative that you are here, and Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time and ending the hearing, I will yield back my time. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back her time. All members have been recognized. I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask that the witnesses respond to the questions promptly. Members should submit their questions by the close of business on Tuesday, February 10th. Without objection, the subcommittee... Oh, we, have one more. we have one more. We have unanimous consent requests for prescription drug monitoring programs and assessment of the evidence for best practices to be for the record without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Hydrocodone anymore. Yeah.